Hi, everyone. Um, welcome to the third interview in the series Recipes um, for Resilience. And um, today, the topic, um, what we're going to discuss is the resilience in the context of being an American love bat and uh, spouse to an Italian surgeon uh, working on the front line. And this is Paulina Mapata, your career wellness and positive intelligence coach. I am on the mission to help individuals and organizations in change, transformation and wellness. And my guest today is Carolyn uh, Parse Risso. And I hope I'm, inter uh, I mean, pronouncing your name decently, hey? <laughs> Absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> and yeah, so let me, uh, and, and so she's, um, uh, well, she's a fellow love bat. I'm also a love bat. And um, she's a mom, she's a courageous uh, solo premier and much more. Uh, um, and uh, professionally, uh, her professional expertise include being a child life and trauma prevention specialist, civilian employee for military overseas, coaching in energy leadership and positive intelligence, as well as combining yoga into all this. Carolyn hails from the USA and is currently based in Italy, but soon on her way to England. So this is very interesting. I think uh, movement wise and, and pandemic wise and all that, it's, it's, it gives an extra flavor for this. And um, so Carolyn, let's, I would like to always start from the personal story um how how what is the what is behind um being a love bat well it started in the hospital uh it started when i was pursuing some postgraduate so i had my master's degree in school counseling and i had been working in in a high school for five years and i knew i wanted to go in a different direction. I knew that I, I was always drawn to healthcare, but I'd already had my master's degree and I thought, well, what could I do that's still in healthcare? So I, I pursued this profession called child life in the United States. In Commonwealth countries, it might be, uh, it's very, very similar to a hospital play specialist. Mm -hmm. So I, I went for the summer. I thought I'm, you know, if this doesn't work out, I can go, I can go back to my job because I had summers off as a, as an educator. So I went to Baltimore from the state of Washington in the United States. So across the country. And for those of us who were from out of town for this internship, we all stayed in a dormitory, just like college students. But I was probably like 28, 27, 28. And in the dorm, uh, during my, my I, I was there for about five months doing a full-time hospital-based internship. Mm -hmm. I met this medical student who was living in the same dorm because it, it, it housed international students and temporary students, like short-term students. And we met through this other, through this Greek student who was there because again, it was an international dorm. And he introduced us, they were tennis partners and it was love at first sight. It was literally love at first sight. I was in the, in the TV room. We had a common TV room in this dormitory and I was watching a film. I was studying for a presentation I was going to give on, um, a, a particular neurosurgery, a pediatric neurosurgery that was used to treat epilepsy. And I had bought this video. It was like VHS video, you know, this is like 1999. And I, I was watching the video and he, here comes this guy, you know, come over here, come meet my friend, Paolo. So he brings them in and, and I was in torn jeans and an old t-shirt lying on the couch, just literally sprawled out watching this video. And, um, you know, we had a chat and at some point, I said, well, what are you here for? And he said, for neurosurgery. And here I was watching this video on neurosurgery and had a real interest in, had for years had an interest in the brain and neuroscience and neurosurgery. And so 
at some point I thought, you know, he said he was from, from Venice. And I, I thought he, I said, Oh, well, that's the West coast, you know, Venice beach. That's I'm, I'm from Washington. <laughs> he had no, I, I could not, he had a, somewhat of a, of an accent, but not one that I could identify as European in any way. Um, and so I thought he was just joking, you know, and I thought, what are you talking about? Venice, Italy, you know? And so anyway, it went on from there and it was fast and furious, like two months we were there together and we just fell in deep, mad love. And then he had to go back to Italy and I finished my residency or my, um, my internship and, and got my first job and it was in Philadelphia. So I went to the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. He went back to Padova, Italy, where he was from, and finished medical school. And we, you know, cried and said, this is the, obviously this can't go on. We're both starting our careers. Um, and I was restarting a career and really loved it, had found the right place for myself, you know, professionally. And was, kind, you know, was really feeling, um autonomous and my really my first move on my own uh that that i had i was behind i had um orchestrated the entire thing you know i was i didn't have a single hand at finding the job at finding the internship i had done everything myself and and it felt really good right so i was really independent found an apartment in philadelphia and started this job and um he kept trying to come to to uh, do the exam. He did the exams so that he could do his residency in the United States. That was his plan was to do his medical residency in the US. Mm -hmm. And that was just part of his plan. And we kept in touch. And, you know, I remember at some point just saying, I don't feel like dating anyone. And he said, me either. And so we were like, well, what are we going to do? You know, we live in different countries and I just really believed that he would eventually get a medical residency and we would just find each other in the US. Mm. And it was quite likely. And after two years and then 9-11 happened and two years of trying, he did all the exams, passed everything. And the residencies just didn't come in. You know, he he had a couple of interviews and and then it, it didn't, it just didn't pan out for him that way. So he ended up moving to the UK and working there and pursuing doing his medical residency in the UK as a neurosurgeon. And so at, at a certain point after four years, I decided I would be the one to move. Mm -hmm. And so that's how I became a love pat. So we, we actually bonded over this intense love of the work of working with patients and around this particular specialty, you know, around surgery and I, I was a child life specialist so I prepared children for surgery psychosocially so I, I helped them through play and through creative expression and uh, developmentally appropriate questioning and answering you know using language that's appropriate for kids yeah. but, um, so that's, 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 that's that's lovely because I think it, uh, in my story it's it's a little bit uh, similar in in such a way that um, that that it's 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 also the work or the studies and the interests really uh, that 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 was um, how 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 I met my husband now and, oh. and and that because I mean there is a lot of stereotypes of love pets uh, also um, you know um, moving from to another country or another place because of status or hmm. whatever but for um, for maybe not necessarily just for the, you know, truly for the relationship and, and, and uh, yeah. building it and, 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 or having very wrong expectations or, or having extremely different backgrounds because I mean, cultural backgrounds alone is, is yes. the thing. And then now if you are like, uh, you know, uh, otherwise a super different, um, uh, then, but because love doesn't look that, isn't it? <laughs> also, right, right. Yeah. And I think also there's there's the common story too of of someone being on vacation. Yes. And meeting someone and falling in love that way when you're in this kind of vacation mindset and it's maybe not your your real life. Uh so yeah, I I see what you're saying. There, that's a different that's a different path yeah. than when you come together around uh you know, a common a profession or work that you both yeah. love. 
But this is interesting because um, I actually didn't remember all your, your background well, because I was just writing a blog uh, about being a love pad and the pains and gains, like, like reflecting cultural shock and the adaptation process, just, just personal perspective. And love pad is not known as um, terminology like widely, even in expat uh, circles. Sometimes if I say, okay, I'm a love pad, I say, excuse me. And then I looked, um, I think in, in Denmark, um, they use it a bit more and, and, and uh, they are saying that it's often the person who, who moves um, for, for romantic reasons to the, to the country of the spouse. But it doesn't necessarily need to be like that. Cause like now you started then living together in England, which is a third country. It's not your country, it's not his country. So tell me right. more about the, the 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 and uh, like the period in England and and um, and then then uh, I mean now you are in Italy how yeah. how long was that and, <laughs> and also like now we know the romantic um, the background and all this beauty but I would also like to hear like about the cultural shock or the adaptation or the the common yeah. like, what were your personal pain points then yeah yes yes so it went a different direction than I expected I when I decided to leave. I was really at the height of my career. I felt really confident and I knew that if I moved to the UK, my job existed there. I knew that I was highly qualified for any any job coming from the, I'd worked in two different top hospitals in the US. And so I just knew, and it was fresh, you know, I, I was in the middle of it. I had been working full time. I had a substantial CV at that point. So I felt really comfortable, I, you know, within reason, I mean, I knew it was a big step, but I, I knew that I would just be able to continue working as soon as we settled somewhere in the UK. And so um, I even started networking and I had contacts in the UK and I visited a couple hospitals, you know, just really started networking. I was really excited about just finding a place to settle. So he was working as what's called a locum, which is like a temporary, it's an agent. He worked for an agency. So he didn't work for the national health system. He worked for an agency and this agency paid for our room and board. So it was this mini adventure. We got to travel all over the UK uh, wherever the job was, and it would be anywhere from one week to three months, four months. And he'd been doing, he did that for a little over two years. I joined him on the last year of that leg. The plan was that then he would find through this temporary agency, uh, um, an in into a residency, become known and then find, you know, apply for resident, a, re a medical specialty residency and go ahead and, and do that. So I kind of just was waiting for him to, to, to find that. And then I was going to continue on. So this went on. In the meantime, we got married. We got married in, um, in Italy. And there are lots of details to that, but I, uh, he, it was really important to him to be married there. And so we did that and that was hard because I was not Catholic and he really wanted a Catholic. He believed that being married in the Catholic church would validate our relationship for his parents. And so I did that. I did that. And for me, that was, I was way out of my comfort zone just doing that. The whole wedding was in Italian. You know, I, I didn't even understand a lot of the words I was using. Um, so that happened, but then we went back to the UK and I thought, well, I can do that. It's a temp, you know, it's just mm -hmm. a, what, what is it called? A um, formality, right? Yeah, yeah. yeah. By the way, because the, the, this, this is indeed, um, I think, obviously a worldview or religion um, can unite or separate or can be, yes. I mean, you can uh, have, different but uh, it, it's okay uh, but depends now you know how you compromise or how how you um, yes. can respect each other's beliefs and and and, and all that um, my, my husband is also catholic um, mm -hmm. but we haven't had a church wedding uh, if we want to have a blessing from the church uh, here in south africa we need to do some kind of a counseling or some some kind yes. of a course did you do that 
No, so this is so interesting because it's the same in the United States. I have friends that that actually had to convert, literally convert uh, to Catholicism to be married in the church for their partner. And so that's what I thought would have to happen. And I said, well, that's not, I'm not, I'm not going to do that. And, um, but it turned out in Italy, they're much more open and they were completely willing to marry us. And we, we, I remember signing something that said we're a, a mixed couple and in Italy, a mixed couple doesn't, isn't related to race as it, as when you hear that in the United States in English, you usually think mixed couple in terms of race, but in Italy, it, it means mixed religion. Mm. And, um, yeah, so that was new for me. And, and so, um, I remember the priest saying, we hope you'll come to us. And if you do, we're here for you. It was just this very open, loving, um, but we, you know, whatever, we accept you and we, we're doing this wedding, <laughs> you know, and there was no pressure really beyond that. We did not have to go to classes or, you know, do anything extra. So I thought, okay, this is okay. I feel comfortable with this. And I appreciate that. I, I was brought in and made to feel a part and not, um, you know, like you're going to have to, to change who you are to be part. So, but there were some, you know, some commitments that I had to make, like that I would raise my children in the Catholic church. There were things like that, that I had to say or sign, um, again, in Italian. <laughs> so I just thought, okay, well, you know, this isn't really relevant because we're not going to live here. And so I'm not too worried about this. So we went back to uh, the UK so that we got married at the end of December. We went back in January and um, I had to go to the US for some weddings and some different things. Long story short, in the meantime, my husband had applied for a medical residency back in Italy. And I didn't know he was planning on doing that. I didn't, I didn't know anything about it. And at some point after I'd gone, I'd actually gone back to the hospital where I'd been working in Baltimore and I, I helped out for a month on a short contract and went to a couple friends' weddings and, you know, just saw family and uh, just tied up some loose ends. And I got this call that said, I, I, I've been accepted into a five-year medical residency in Verona and it starts in July. And this was probably April or May. And... I was at my parents' house, you know, we weren't even together at that moment. I hadn't even packed my things in the apartment that we're, where we were staying in, in England. And that was that it was, it was the beginning of a very, very difficult period. And, you know, we'd been married like three months. So it really took this turn. Um, you know, we talked about, is this really a choice that I have? Is this something I'm not, I was totally unprepared. I hadn't been studying the language. I could have been, you know, I had all these things that for me as a, as an expat, you know, as a, ch I had chosen my way, but I wasn't, this was not a comfortable path for me. This is not a, a path I would have chosen for myself, you know, knowing that I, I, I highly valued doing meaningful work and I highly valued communication and all these things, you know? And so that began a series of pain points, Paulina, that, you know, we can talk about. Yeah. Yeah. So, so one, one was that it, 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 it was like a, a bit shocking, like a, 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 a change of, of the path that you were really preparing and, and you thought is the path. And then this news come, um, probably yeah. nicer for nicer nicer for him to have a, a a place a permanent place where to work and all that isn't it yes all those benefits but now the country was different okay yeah. so if you if you just need to shortly say let's mm -hmm. say three three main challenges in in then um moving to italy and 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 and, and making a life in italy what would you say where where maybe three three main uh, pain points and and more importantly, I would like us to focus on what how have you managed them because you are still married and you are still yeah, <laughs> yeah so it's still a, married but, and I'm still in Italy after yes. sixteen we I've been here sixteen years in July yeah 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 
Yes, I, those are very easy. Okay, the, the, the biggest challenge was the language acquisition. Mm -hmm. um, I did go into intensive language courses. It was wonderful. It was a beautiful program. But then what interfered in that was that I needed to earn money and I needed to do it quickly because a medical residency in Italy is much, much different in pay than in the United States. So when he originally said, I'm going to do the medical residency in Italy, because his idea was that it was, it would be shorter than in the UK. And then we could just return so he could go and get it done. He had a spot and there were some other factors as well that I learned about much later as to why he wanted to do that. Mm -hmm. And I guess he didn't feel like sharing them at the time because he was afraid maybe it wouldn't work out or something, yeah. but it had to do with a, a relationship that, that that program had with the United States. So he was thinking it would be this way, maybe into back into the United States, but for sure that he would be able to return to the UK more quickly. Yeah. So he had re really good intentions and, and this, but he didn't share all this with me. And this was part of being newly married, right? And not maybe being used to really needed to include another person in your decision making, <laughs> you know, and, yeah. and talking about that. We weren't used to being a, a couple maybe in that way. Um, and so anyway, the, the language acquisition, I really had, uh, expectations that it would not be that hard to learn the language. If I just did an intensive course, mm -hmm. I had studied a little bit at a night class. I studied French in college, in high school. So, you know, I thought it would be fine. I thought of myself as a competent, intelligent person. So I did that. So I started with the intensive course, but then realized, oh, back to the residency part, the money part, which was that it was extremely different. So it was more of a stipend payment in Italy. So it was around 800 euros a month. Oh dear, yeah. Um, yeah. For five years. But not in a Not in that was like, what? Yeah. Yeah, that would be maybe to pay your rent in the city, yeah. you know, of Verona. Yeah. And so I was like, well, what, what, how are we going to do this? You know, what was, I mean, I didn't learn that until we got there. So suddenly I was, I had to find work, but I didn't speak the language well enough. And I had no experience with like working in a cafe or something like that. I didn't have anything there to offer. And I thought about, you know, maybe teaching English. Somebody told me, try that. There's so many English schools. So I went a I had never done anything like that as, at, at all. I wasn't a teacher. I was a, a counselor. Mm -hmm. So uh, I put together a resume and took it to a couple English schools and never heard from him. And then eventually um, I was put into contact through a contact of my dad's back in the United States uh, with somebody who worked on the army base. And I didn't know about this, but there was an, a US army base about a, um, an hour away. And so those here, let me go back to my, my three top, you know, challenges. One was the language. One was how to earn money um, at, at a level that I was used to. I had always, I was autonomous, you know, by the time we got married, I was 33 or 34. Uh, you know, I was used to supporting myself. I hadn't asked my parents for money yeah. since I was in college. You know, I just that wasn't part of my realm. So I couldn't understand what we were doing, how we were, what the plan had, was in my husband's mind. Um, and so anyway, long story short is to say, I did get a job uh, on the army base. So what happened was though, that was an English speaking environment. And so I had to give up the immersion, the Italian immersion. Mm -hmm. it, it was like, I had to choose between Italian immersion and really learning how to live and be in Italy versus making money to support us. Mm. Uh, so of course I could continue to study Italian, but um, you know, I ended up having a full, you know, full-time job and, and fully immersed in the American community and then speaking English at home when I came home to Paolo, cause that was our yeah. love language. Yeah. 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 So <laughs> those two things, I guess that the, the third would be the we can get to that part, but career loss, you know, this, uh, I guess I got a job, but the loss of, of the career that I had chosen 
that I loved, which I thought I would be able to continue in the UK, which did not exist in Italy. Yeah, and, was- and what, what I hear, what I hear is that, that, that these are actually all linked to, to sort of a bigger thing of, of and even you even used the word of, of being autonomous, having autonomy or being independent, mm-hmm. and, and maybe even a, a identity. I hear that yes. profession and work is, is, is a big part of your identity. And, and all that got like, dismantled and, and, yes. and then you needed to, to build it uh, up again. Um, isn't it this, uh, this interview, we are, we are, we are, we are doing this uh, during the 2021 um, um, and we are still under the pandemic, uh, mm-hmm. the corona, uh, corona COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And I, I just want to, to see like, uh, because obviously these things are, uh, at least in my case, I think that the you know the adaptation process it's never over. <laughs> I mean, it you sort of adapt and, and get somewhere, mm-hmm. and and then something happens and and it starts again. And uh, definitely globally, uh, the pandemic is a shock and change to the system. Is there anything? Uh, and I'm even thinking um, you've worked in uh, you know in a as a civilian in the military. So those yeah. Well, okay, it was not war in Italy, but um, but still the, the military people that's what that's their work isn't it and then yeah. you you your husband works in a hospital in mm-hmm. a front line so mm-hmm. is there some uh, some specific pain point or 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 or, pay, or 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 challenges in in relation to that as a as a as a now as a spouse or as a, a person who is supporting well, I think I think you know when I worked when I worked for the military, it was actually during the deployment. So oh, okay, about five, almost five years, where families were de- where where uh, active duty service people were deployed for almost that entire. I mean, they come back, but then they get redeployed. They had very long deployments, and they're so I worked with the families that were left on the po on the on the base while their partner was deployed oh all over the world wherever the crisis Afgan- was. well it was afghanistan at the time afghanistan and iraq um oh, yeah. but mostly crazy. afghanistan and and so it was a very very intense time on the base and and people were very very stressed including the children so a lot of uh, so I, I i worked to support the families and children and spouses um, and then eventually, at the end, before I left there, I was also working with active duty uh, military service members. I was working with them in, in doing training for them. And so I, I definitely what I what I've learned. So they were definitely on the front lines in that in that way. And we spent a lot of time um, helping families to live in a being separated, you know, how to live in separation and to live knowing that your partner was uh, in danger in harm's way, that kind of chronic stress. Yeah. And, and then the reunification piece where people would come back and they, they were different, they changed, they have a different perspective, you know, there was a transformation that occurred when, you know, when they would go to war, when they would be deployed for so long in an environment in, 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 in the environment that they were in. And so how, how to help families reunite and couples reunite and, um, you know, in a way so they can stay together. So many, there are little pieces of this that do resonate also as a, as a spouse of a frontline worker in terms of like during the pandemic, um, in our case, some of it was indirect. It, it's not, um, uh, because my husband's a surgeon and not an infectologist or a, an infection um, or a, sorry, an uh, intern, um, God, what is it called? Uh, not an anesthesiologist, intensivist, intensivist. So intensivist is, is the person that, that are the physicians that work in the intensive care unit mm-hmm. or um, the ER, you know, those kinds of positions where people are coming in and it's just one after the other. Um, he's more, he has been more removed, but affected indirectly. 
And so we had a few of those things where like for a while when it was really bad or we were concerned that it was going to get much worse a year ago, my son and I ended up going to a second location, going, moving, moving, leaving the house because my husband was going to start helping with the COVID unit. Uh, yeah. Okay. Just so to, we, for safety. Yeah. Uh, sure. Safety, yeah. Uh, yeah. Possibly infection or something. Yeah. Yeah, we weren't sure yet. We didn't have as much knowledge now. We had more fear and we also were watching it move on the news. We were just watching it move from Milan. We're only a couple of hours from Milan. And that was where the epicenter, one of the epicenters was. And we were just watching it creep up and creep up and creep up. And then it started, to, the numbers started to rise in our area. And at that point, he said, I, I volunteered to, to work the COVID unit. And I said, okay, so what are we, what should we do? And we just, we just made that decision. We weren't, um, it was, there was a hard lockdown and we were lucky enough to have a second home based on, from when I worked on the army base, I, I, we bought a house that was close to my work there. And so we had that house and we packed our car because we didn't know when we come back. We didn't know what was going to happen to him. I didn't, you know, we just didn't know. And we'd been hearing lots of things about, you know, physicians getting sick and uh, all of that. So, but we just had to felt like we had to make a decision and, and we did it. And so we spent six months separated and he was able to come a couple of times to, and it was just, again, two hours away, but you weren't supposed to cross the, the border yeah, of the yeah. regions. Yeah. yeah so yeah. Mm. yeah, we did that and it, and it, it was all okay. And school, because school had been, you know, had gone online. And so that's what we decided to do. Um, but the other thing that I, the, the other thread that is similar, that I think that all spouses, when you have, when you have a partner who's working in, in the front line of some, um, you know, intense work, helping other people or, you know, where they're, where there's life and death situation happening is that you have to be able to hold that space for your partner when they come home or when they are silent or they seem like they don't want to talk or they do want to talk and they're telling you every little detail that's way more than you need or want to know. Mm -hmm. And to be able to hold that space, I think that has been um, a resilient, a resilience building space and i i have the skills to do that and i i think that you know it's intense also for me yeah so uh not everyone has has those skills or you know we some of us need support in that in holding that space for our partner yeah and I, listen isn't it I, I think we went a bit fast forward because um, oh. um i think we need to update <laughs> Listen, so from the army pace, eventually you you decided to move where your husband is and you had a son and, and all that yeah. and, and you became a coach. Also. Yeah, yes. So I think that your, your um, you know, your, that background of, of, I mean, obviously you were already a counselor and, and, and all that. And then you yes. added, added an additional uh, coaching, uh, coaching skills and, and certificates and, and, I mean, studies and practice on top of all this mm -hmm. um but um indeed this is i think uh, i'm saying is that that it also affects you yeah you mm -hmm. you, you 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 are lucky to have even professionally some skills and methods and you understand what is it to hold yeah this and i worked in a hospital setting you know yeah. so I, I i understand the pace i understand what the the, the painful things that you you see um, and you witness and how, how you can absorb that if you're actually engaged in your work, you know? Yeah. So I, I do understand that part. Luckily. Then, yeah. So, but then it, it, despite, um, it, you need to take off your care of your own resilience and your own yeah. wellness. So what are your, like, what have you learned throughout your, your like sort of a love patch journey and through your, this profession and all that, how do you, how do you keep up or make sure that you have that resilience to support others, even your own yeah. spouse now mm -hmm. in this kind of a situation? Well, I think the number one thing that I've learned is that I am responsible for 
my experience. I am responsible for my my ultimately my choices and and my well-being. Only I am responsible for my own well-being. And when I made that shift and I was no longer expecting him to be responsible for my well-being and when I was able to shift or transform or see his choices differently <laughs> so that I wasn't blaming him. I spent a lot of a low time blaming him for the choices he made for me. Um, because yes, we have choices. My choice could have been not to go with him, right? To have refused. Um, I don't know that the choice that he would have made a different choice, you know? So I, so yes, there are choices, but I really did have to take ownership of the choices I had made and to decide how I wanted to be in my marriage. I had to decide, do I want to be in with all this low energy, this low, um, cat, this catabolic energy, which was made up of, of blame and resentment and regret and all of this, you know, and there was a time for that, believe me. Yeah. Yeah. So I, I took responsibility for that and he was supportive of that. So I, I, I began with getting my own coach at my lowest point. I got a coach mm. and started to prioritize myself in that way. I had a toddler, so, you know, I needed. Oh, yeah. So it's a dual thing, a motherhood yes. and everything. And then, yes. Yeah. And you know, the other, there was another little unique pain point in there of being a spouse to a frontline worker. Um, was that when we had a baby, I guess I just thought we would be equal. I was a modern woman and, you know, he was a modern man. And I, um, I really thought that we would have equal, we would, be, you know, he'd be helping in the middle of the night and that kind of thing. And in the end, I just remember this night after when the baby was very, very tiny still and nursing every two to three hours and I wasn't getting any, any sleep and Paolo didn't have, um, he didn't have the paternity leave. I don't know what happened. Everyone says in Italy, oh, it's so great. But I, I, I don't think his hospital um, granted him paternity leave. He had a few days off, but he didn't have like two weeks or three weeks or whatever some people do. And so uh, he was back and I just back to work. And I remember having this excruciating, probably some kind of hormone headache, excruciating headache. And the baby was crying and I felt nauseous and I, I was sick, you know, I wasn't well and the baby needed to be fed and he just didn't wake up my husband just didn't wake up you know and i was just like can you get the baby you know you get to... and i just remember this thing getting up being sick coming back him never waking up and just at some point having this and and then i re remember that he said he had surgery in the morning and i remember this choice that i had like if i wake him up in the middle of the night to help me maybe i would endanger a patient and or maybe you know endanger his ability to 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 do his job well and that was this huge turning point um difficult turning point when i realized that i wasn't going to be waking him up he wasn't going to wake up on his own and i wasn't going to be with waking him up mm -hmm. and that it was all on me and um so that's how it went so by the time i had a toddler i was really tired really really tired mm -hmm. and didn't, couldn't figure out how to have any time to myself, not a moment. And so I worked with the coach to carve out five minutes, you know, five minutes here. I started just with that, that task. And then really looking at the lot, you know, the loss I was feeling. I, I had a lot of grief and loss around my career and around mm -hmm. what I thought I, what I thought it would be like to, to, sh to share parenting because I had all these assumptions based on my friends' experiences back in my hometown where it was so community everybody was at each other's homes and they had a part-time job that they could go back to that they'd taken time off from and job sharing and i mean everything was seemed really balanced and supported and i had that in my head so that that assumption or um, expectation of what it would be like ended up undermining my experience yeah so so you mentioned that that you actually um, recruited a coach 
and and yes. and, and then that was through a process and it started like a I call those kind of things like a radical, uh, mini radical, you know, whatever relaxation or whatever uh, uh, yeah, <laughs> moments <yeah>. for breaks. <laughs> and it's very yeah. similar. Uh, I think it's very similar what we are now um, uh, uh, looking and doing together, uh, the positive intelligence and the, mm -hmm. the mental fitness techniques. And yeah. then what I love in it is, is that, because because you, you, you then, was it then after this personal coaching experience that you went to study coaching and uh, and yoga and and all this what you what you currently been yes doing? that was it was a few years later but I set my intention I don't have it in front of me but I set a vision statement for my future work at the very last thing I did with that in that coaching relationship it was six six months long and it allowed me to create a vision statement for my just my every day how yeah. do i want to live every day i was just really doing one day at a time at that time and then i left that with a future a vision of work because i could not i was in a place where i could not see the future i could not visualize i could not set goals yeah. i i could not imagine my future in this because we moved to a a, a german speaking town that's another part of the story, right? So I, I had studied Italian and I did another intensive when I left my job to join my husband. Um, we'd been living apart for a year because he got a job here where we are. And I still had a great job and community where I was living, um, where I was working on the army base. So, um, but we wanted to start a family and we wanted to be living together. <laughs> and so I said, okay, will i'll come up there and I, and i was very very hopeful i just knew it would all work out and um you know i was ready i was 38 and just ready for that and yeah that's another segment of like the expectations of moving of doing that moving when i was pregnant you know moving to a new place yeah. being pregnant so that and, really really went along with the becoming yeah. a parent becoming a mom yeah and again, leaving something behind. And then a, and a new, leaving something behind. And then this other, what I thought, again, assumptions and, and just not understanding what I was entering into. Um, I, I knew it was bilingual. I knew it was bicultural, but I, I just thought it's Italy and, you know, yeah. it's Italy. So it's, but it, it's really different. It's a really different culture. And we particularly, you know, we found a home in 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 a, in a town that's two maybe two percent of the people speak Italian as their um, mother tongue. So there was a shift there. You know, that was a, another. My son went to a German speaking uh, preschool, and I, you know, I studied German for a little bit when I when I could when he was in in preschool. So because I just, you know, I remember things like, you know misunderstanding and there was there I thought there was no school one day so I kept him home and in fact there'd been a big party that day at school and I just didn't understand the German you know hand the uh, aviso the the parent letter that I got and I just didn't I didn't understand <laughs> so things like that happened and here I was in Italy and I'd studied Italian and I was trying and then I just you know didn't know what I was yeah. doing yeah so the yeah. competence this feeling of um a, a loss of competence was huge for me all, all across the board. Also, when I worked in the army in the beginning, because I had to, to learn a new system, you know, that I wasn't familiar yeah. with. Yeah. Um, and it's quite interesting uh, because uh, like um, English is a, is a world language, uh, but indeed there are so many other countries that totally operate uh, in their own languages. Yes. So, so and, uh, it, it's, they are, I've, I've had it easy. Um, like like moving to an English speaking country and, and already having English in my repertoire, um, just learn yeah. it better. Uh, I think that and and that that both of us <laughs> we speak English so that it's it's uh, yeah. that was so much easier. So that that is definitely a big part. And then then how it relates into into your functionality and and into your 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 independence again and your autonomy yeah. and, and 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 all that um that kind of a thing now um it's quite a journey and um and then there is in the horizon um 
there is that move to, 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 to England. But let's not go there. Maybe we'll have another uh, another. Yeah, interview. yeah, yeah. When we'll you see. Go. Yeah. Talk to me in a few months, and I'll see yeah. how that how that went. <laughs> yeah. Just to, just to say to to everyone that it's it's not once off. And even if you don't move to across the ocean or you know to another continent or between the countries, I think uh, change change is evident. And 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 I think it's it's just when you are in an intercultural and um, relationship and. Uh, work and so forth it it really adds extra layers um that the kind of things that carolyn carolyn has uh, shared now because now you you are a professional uh who 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 who've been helping um uh, other people both in the military environment in the hospital environment um and also in the expatriates uh environment you've been helping other expats and love pets um in with with their own struggles um mm -hmm. let's go let's see um what what would you what would you advise there's a couple of things that i've, I've already heard it's it's that you have to take ownership of your own wellness that's mm -hmm. that came very clear and uh and then, then you mentioned that that when you, if you are feeling if you are in a low place or something, don't struggle alone. Why don't you reach out for additional support? And, and yeah. you reached out for a coaching. It could be a counselor. It could be something else, isn't it? Yes, I just whoever was the first person that came up when I did the Google, you know, <laughs> search at the time. That's who I. Now there's so many, but at the time there was only one person came up as an expat coach. Yeah, yeah. So. Yeah. So then what, what else, like what, what are kind of techniques yeah. now that um, even just, just we are all actually um, globally, uh, many people are in transition, um, even if it's nothing to do internationally or something, but they are in transition because they, the, the, the pandemic has somehow changed. They yes. Yes. Uh, whether financially, whether they've lost a loved one, whether mm -hmm. whatever, it, it, it's different things. What could be the kind of things um, that could help? What could be the strategies, daily strategies? Yeah, yeah. Well, and, and these were strategies that I that I use, that I have used for years now, that I built over time and practice, and and that I recommend for everyone. I really do. One is to get back in your body. Um, it's so easy to get to become separated from your body, from the connection to your own body, whether it's uh, around body image that you just, you know, have disconnected, um, or maybe there's a health issue, or um, maybe you just aren't, you're just so much in your head thinking all the time that you're just not noticing what your body is sensing. And so the, the first thing is to move your body to get into it to get to know it <laughs> again and um and that can be done in, in very simple ways like just going for a walk and that's that's how i started it i started because i wanted to lose baby baby weight that was my initial reason and it turned and, and it was just and i wanted to you know kind of have something to do with my son outside um and what happened was that desire for exercise in the beginning. It was actually not for exercise. The desire was to lose weight. <laughs> and that morphed. And now it's been 10 years. And I was not, I should say, not an active person. I was not an athletic person, nor did I have any kind of daily or weekly practice in my life. I, I just, I had, you know, taken some aerobics classes here and there in my life, but was not a day, you know, not a runner, not a walker. Yeah. And I started with this need for stress relief. You know, I just needed to get out of the house. And what I learned was I, the fresh air, the sun, <laughs> um, the connection, I found a partner who wanted to do the same thing. So having that connection with someone else in the beginning was really helpful. Mm -hmm. And then what happened was I started to notice my surroundings. And so this can happen no matter where you are. I started really tuning in to what I was seeing yeah. in this very intense way. Then my son got older, he went to school, then I was alone, then I was walking by myself. So I started, and I, then I got the fancy camera, you know, the 
phone. <laughs> I mean, this kind of dates me, but right, we I didn't have a phone, uh, a camera phone in the beginning. Uh, once that happened, I started really tuning in, doing doing photography, and that focused in my my visual senses, and I started to really appreciate yeah. every little piece of nature, right? Yeah. Everything that I saw, and then I started tuning into my breath and feeling the inhale, feeling the exhale. Okay, so this practice went on um, and it became a truly mindful morning walk. Mm. And, and that came first for me, but it can be once around the block. It can be, I'm just gonna go outside today and feel the sun on my face on my balcony or on my porch. And it starts just tuning in, you know, to the sensations, which is what we talk about in positive intelligence. Yeah, yeah. And then, that just moved forward at some point yes i, I started taking yoga i wanted to in, i wanted to incorporate yoga into a retreat setting so i wanted to do that's how it started for me i wanted to have yoga i wanted to have an italian coaching retreat where there would be yoga wow. and italian food and the yoga and, and the, the wine, yeah, and, and and oh, the wine. wine. yes wine. <laughs> Sure, if you want, you know, so I had this whole idea with the vine view retreat and my friend who was a yoga instructor said, why don't you just come to a yoga train, a yoga teacher training? And I was like, what are you talking about? You know, I was not, yeah. what are you talking about? <laughs> that wasn't my path, but I did it. And uh, it was right after I finished my coach training, probably a year later. Yeah, a year later. And I just got hooked every course as I understood, as I connected more with my body, connected what I knew about coaching and all the work we do in our heads yeah. <laughs> in coaching. Yeah. When I saw the power of, of that in the body, when we connect that to the body, um, I just went forward and I ended up getting my certificate uh, and teaching yoga to the local expat mom community here. And then I started incorporating that into my coaching practice, which is how, how we met. Yeah, that's, yeah. that's correct. So, so that's, that's so beautiful. And I can, I can totally, totally relate um, myself. And, and, and like, if I'm thinking about um, many people, friends, family members, and, and even clients, so especially when, we, when we, we are having the stressful life or, or get into chronic stress. And, and isn't it, we talk about chronic stress, but it's actually burning yourself out, depleting yourself. Yes. <laughs> but yeah, that depleted. happens that you get bogged into your head and, and you, do, you don't even, you know, you might have aches and whatever, but you still, you know, that is the only connection to your body that you have a backache or you have uh, something. But, but all your functionality is like the thinking part and it becomes very negative, which then has, again, the negative reflection to your emotions, your heart and to your body. So, 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 so lovely to, and, and like really how to shift it. Just like, like you said, go to the balcony, just feel the sun on your face. Uh, if there is no sun, feel the rain on your face. Just yes. feel. <laughs> I did all weather. I did snow. I mean, I was I was serious. It was serious rehabilitation for me. Yeah. You know? yeah. Um, I don't have to do it every day anymore because I I do it now naturally all the time. Yeah. I tune in to yeah. my senses all the time. And you probably do yoga also quite regularly and yes. uh, and other this and that but that's so lovely to 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 hear and then this is what you teach your clients yes it, like like you have the uh, in, how in, to expat, begin. isn't it that that's where you combine the two or the energetic expat group yeah yes it, you, that's where we we think and we learn and then we also add a sensory experience with that experience so we we learn how to feel the different energy levels in our body yeah. and then we have something that we can use to engage that energy so if it's the, that blame shame that cat that lower catabolic energy or if it's more constructive how do we shift into that sage mindset that we talk about in positive intelligence and that's usually by getting into your into your senses and yeah. helping yourself shift a little yeah. bit that way creating space yeah. And using the breath. There was one other thing, though, I wanted to add. Um, the mindfulness. 
getting into your senses, getting into your body, maybe yoga or something, you know, but just something physical where you're, you're feeling your body. Oh, that oftentimes we're also avoiding our emotions. So in the beginning, I may have been, I, I was going outside maybe to, to deal with my stress, you know, to, to get rid of it, I thought maybe, or to um, burn it off. So also I was avoiding my emotions mm -hmm. because my emotions were really big and they were really uncomfortable. And I did feel better after going outside. I felt better, but I still wasn't dealing with those emotions. Yeah. So there's a, there's a different, and I, I say, start how you start, you know, just do it. Doesn't matter in the beginning. Usually we, we need to get ourselves to a place where we feel better before we can feel the strength to really go in there and, and, yeah. and see what it is we're feeling. And that's where it's really great to work with someone else to hold that space, who, who knows how to hold that space exactly. when you're going to feel all your feelings. Yeah. But yoga helps with that too. I've had experiences where I thought I was done with something, you know, that I worked through that. And then I worked on some part of my body and did some yoga and, and felt it come up, you know, again, and felt it release. So yeah. that's, what's been really um, a surprise. It's been a pleasant surprise in my journey. Cause I never in a million years would have ever thought I would become a yoga teacher. Um, and have the experiences I've had with connecting to my body, appreciating my body, loving it the way it is. Yeah. And if you needed to, if you needed to just to, to make it even more like concrete for, for, for people who are looking and, and listening, mm -hmm. if you needed to rate like this, your journey between one and 10, like uh, the, the worst possible um, emotions feelings and 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 the challenges and and that space where you were uh um like between one that it's the worst 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 and then mm -hmm. 10 like where, where where were you at your lowest or and and where you know where are you after integrating these uh resilience practices and the, i would say i was definitely at a at a one <clears throat> at my lowest at um the bottom yeah i was at the i was at the bottom i was afraid for myself. Okay. So I, I was really at a low place and that's because I was a counselor. I had counselor training. I could recognize yeah. in myself that I was in my lowest place. And so that's when I reached out for help. Yeah. And so, yes. So then to, I would say I started at a one and through all of this, I'd say eight there's always space. I'm still working. There's always space to improve. I have bad days still. Um, but that's also I, normal. I, it's I, normal. I think yeah. it, it's very few individuals, if any, who yeah. find that it's sort of oh. a stage that they are at the 10, 9, yeah. 10 all the time. So but I know that I have, here's the difference is that I, now I know what to do. I know what works for me. I've, I've experimented with lots of different things. Yeah. Yeah. And um, I don't deny my my emotions anymore. So I know that that has to happen. Yeah. It's not um, it's not like a point of of pride that I don't ha you know that I can stuff my feelings <laughs> like that used to be something that I you know I thought that was resilience, but that's not resilience. It's not stuffing your feelings, but actually processing out what you're and. And doing that without judgment, I think that's what another big part of what we work on with, you know, in positive intelligence and mental fitness is we don't need to, to judge our experience. It is our experience. Yeah. Yeah. To look okay. at it, to, to, to really to try to see it um, from from the positive perspective as a as an opportunity. Yeah. Um, yeah. For, for something new. And it's a it's a it's a lovely story, like uh, really, I mean, uh, um, from a very medical and, and healthcare uh, into this this like um, wellness space and yoga, uh, I think it's. Uh, I mean, they are not actually they are not too they are not too far, uh, but no. the tools are very different, I believe. Um, yeah, and I mean, I really have this clear vision, Paulina, of of bringing this to bringing this these concepts to healthcare providers to yeah. frontline workers not as a band-aid because i know that they're being offered in wellness programs i know that some people 
have said, well, there's a systemic problem that causes our burnout. There's a systemic problem. These th things need to change in the system, right? Mm -hmm. That's where our stress comes from. But I, I do believe that we all can benefit from having some of these skills and that whatever, whatever the source of the stress is, we still, it's still on, on, on us to, yeah. to manage our, our own experience and to, to be able to make choices and to choose how we want to show up in the life that we're living. And so I have this clear vision of, you know, frontline workers doing yoga and releasing all that, you know, grief that builds up and compounded grief and um, having that support and being able to, you know, talk in a, in a place that's not yeah. th th where there's objective non-judgment, you know, I yeah. just, I can see it. So there is a place where I see these pieces of my life and my past and my present coming together to create something. Yeah, no. so that's that, that's great, and I I, I mean definitely um, uh, these kind of um, uh, techniques and tools uh, they apply they apply um, to to many contexts or, or or this and and especially when when you are in a in a hardship or you know type of a, um, in that chronic stress and 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 or if you feel that your values are not aligned. To, you know, in that system where you operate, yes. so all that. So I think that the, these tools are totally. To, I totally agree that that these are the can be very even the the simple um, PQ reps uh, without before you get into the actual yoga, and and then you can yeah. you can evolve. Um, Carolyn, um, tell a little bit about um, how can people find more about. Um, uh, what, what is your company and how can people find you online and and what what are the current um, what is currently going on what are the current services sure sure my my company is called interval coaching this is my i have to show you this beautiful thing that my husband made or had made for me this is my mm -hmm. logo it's a rest note so um we're both amateur my husband and i are both amateur musicians and I have always loved this, this symbol of, for me as a singer, or if you, you know, if you play a horn or an inst an instrument, you know, a, a wind instrument, the breath, the, the rest note, the quarter or rest note is where you would take your breath. And it's that space to replenish, to stop the silence between notes, you know, this whole metaphor. And so this is the, the, the symbol, the logo of my practice and of my business, because I, I love to explore with people that space between breaths and or space between notes where there's this time of transition and anything is possible, right? And so um, that's my business. It's interval coaching and consulting. And I'm currently running a membership in that group called the energetic expat there's an energetic expat learning community and i have a series of courses in that but we are transitioning as i add positive intelligence and mental fitness some of these pq reps that we're talking about some of these other practices i'm in the process of incorporating that into my current program so it's changing but you can i have a website it's www.intervallifecoach.com I'll and you can learn more about the show notes. Um, yeah, um, all yeah. your links and the show notes. So on your website, uh, you 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 tell more about yourself and your yeah. services. You can and, learn and, more. And do you also, if someone is interested, do you also do? And I, I I believe most of us coaches we do the free exploratory call or or something like that. Yeah, yeah, I do a, an assessment call, and I also I offer services to families who have children who are going to have a kind some kind of a uh, healthcare experience, a medical ex experience. I still offer those services to expats because many times those services are not available to them. So you'll see a part, it'll say how to support your child. There's a part of that on my website too. And those services, I do still offer those um, consultations. Yeah. But you'll see two things. You'll see supporting global women in transition. 
using some of these things that I've talked about, courses, also there's a one-on-one coaching. Um, always, I always uh, am available for that. I will be going through a transition, so I'm not taking new clients uh, this summer, but I'll start again in September. Yeah. But please reach out if you, you know, just to have questions and I do do free consultations. Yeah. And this is, evo- I'm like, literally it's evolving right now. Um, starting next week, we're adding positive intelligence to the membership program. Yeah. And the membership yeah. program is six months. So it'll end in, in July and then I'll start a new round. So, so okay. So Thank you so much, Carolyn. So um, for everyone, I'm going to put Carolyn's website and, and those other links um, in, in the show notes um, on my website. And then uh, if you are interested in something, why don't you drop her an email or through her contact page, contact her? Um, because I'm in a few months and, and then she, she will be starting uh, things again. And yeah. if you are in a low place, I think that is the very important part. If you're finding yourself in the bottom, uh, please try some of these um, tips what Carolyn was uh, uh, giving and reach out for more support. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Paulina. Thank it was you. It so lovely to, to engage to another love, love pet. Yes.